Muslim Justice League was founded um, in large part in response to federal announcements of a countering violent extremism program targeting Boston. That was really the proximate cause and four Muslim women, including myself, founded MJL uh, in order to be a locally driven Muslim-led organization advocating for human and civil rights that are violated under national security pretexts. We had been active in the local community on a pro bono basis, providing Know Your Rights presentations after the Boston Marathon bombing, helping uh, connect people with uh, counsel when they were approached by the FBI, for example. But this announcement that Boston was a target of this federal surveillance program um, gave us the recognition that we really needed something more formalized. Um, and, and prior to the Countering Violent Extremism, or CVE pilot, there had been certain infrastructure in Boston, in the community, that continues. And what I mean by that is federal law enforcement had, for many years, engaged in monthly meetings through a program called BRIDGES, which stands for, depending on who you ask, either building, resilient, I'm sorry, building relationships in diverse groups to enhance security or to enhance sensitivity, depending on who you ask. Right? And this consists of uh, closed-door meetings with folks who are um, identified as so-called community leaders in the Muslim community. There is a small amount of Sikh representation as well. And then various federal law enforcement agencies, the Department of Justice being the leader, um, but also Department of Homeland Security, IRS, Boston Police, so not just federal law enforcement, state police, et cetera, um, certainly FBI. And these meetings um, continually, community members who participate bring up similar concerns again and again, usually profiling at the border and the airport is a, is a primary one. Um, and those issues are not systemically resolved. Um, through a Freedom of Information request in California, it was revealed that these programs, uh, at least there, and it's likely here as well, are used as a means of gathering intelligence on the community. Um, and MJL is concerned also that they are a means of really shielding our community's concerns from public view, public discussion, and through the kind of recourse that um, advocacy through the channels that are available to all Americans would provide. But nevertheless, this Bridges program provided a, a group of community members to whom the Department of Justice was um, able to promote the CVE program and try to recruit for participation as so-called community partners. Um, we believe, I should say, that the folks who participate in Bridges, that the community members who participate, do so in good faith, believing that uh, their participation can help resolve the issues that the community is facing. Unfortunately, um, the community is not getting much in return for their participation, um, but we have now um, a program that we are even more concerned about, CBE, because it is essentially Bridges on steroids. Um, the uh, Department of Justice is encouraging folks to participate in countering violent extremism programs, trying to recruit folks in the healthcare sector, social services sector, education sector, to act really as agents of soft surveillance on our communities, um, to profile people for um, so-called pre-criminal behavior, which is actually non-criminal behavior, and, and often using the language that would appeal to social services in terms of talking about vulnerability, um, helping people who have experienced trauma, or building community resilience. And yet, um, based on the experience of CBE in the UK for the last 10 years, we think that it's going to have exactly the opposite result, that it's going to fragment our communities, cause Muslims to feel that, and other marginalized communities, that it's not safe to go to law, I'm sorry, to help services, um, that we are being increasingly bullied in school. Our children are being more bullied not only by their peers, but perhaps by school staff who are being wrongly told that certain expressions of dissent are signs of potential extremism or radicalization and subjecting our kids to um, interventions to change their political and religious views. As a result, we're already seeing um, increased division in our communities, decreased trust in our communities, increased fear of using health services even. And I can say at the Muslim Justice League where we receive requests sometimes to refer people to certain social services or mental health services, it's becoming very, very difficult to know what the safe locations are that we can refer people to, who we are certain is not participating in a CBE program that will cast 
uh, patients as potential extremists or ask them inappropriate questions that have nothing to do with the ailment that brought them to their doctor. I know that the Department of Justice uh, spoke at a local panel actually where I was also speaking for the Greater Boston Muslim Health Initiative um, about so-called safety and CVE and we shared our, our perspective and our concerns on that panel but um, definitely there has been outreach um, we know that the U.S. Attorney's Office outreached uh, more than a, a year ago to uh, Massachusetts school nurses. Um, so there is quite a bit of recruitment going on, but we do not know all the specific agencies and groups that have been contacted. So um, at the end of September in 2015, the Department of Justice, uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office for the District, District of Massachusetts specifically, which are, is a federal prosecuting agency, um, signed an agreement with Massachusetts Executive Office of Health and Human Services, our state health and human services agency that oversees our Department of Mental Health, our Department of Public Health, our Office of Medicaid, um, and other social services and health services programs. This is a copy of the cooperative agreement that they signed. Um, and it directs that um, the Department of Justice has released $217,000 to the Executive Office of Health and Human Services and that UHHS, our Health and Human Services Office, will collaborate with the Department of Justice to um, distribute that funding to other groups, to whether they be nonprofit organizations or uh, public agencies or private agencies, um, for implementation, quote unquote, of strategies to enhance resilience to violent extremism. We spoke with the Executive Office of Health and Human Services and raised our concerns about this program. And they did, I'm happy to say, open up a request for input in mid-March um, in which they give a little bit more detail about what they are planning to do with these funds. And it's very concerning. Um, they described three potential areas of work, the second of which is very redolent of both the Channel Program in the United Kingdom and the FBI's so-called Shared Responsibility Committees. So EOHHS described something it called a multidisciplinary team, which would um, focus on uh, referrals for children and young adults aged 10 and to 24, um, who, uh, whose behavior has raised concerns regarding mobilization toward violence, is the language that they use. It, um, that's a very passive construction, right? We don't know whose concerns <laughs> those are. Um, or what definitions will be put out about what concerning behavior is, but we're not talking about criminal behavior or threats, I think we can assume. Um, concerning behavior, when we've spoken with the Department of Justice, um, has often included First Amendment protected behavior, such as watching certain videos. Um, the multidisciplinary teams are said to consist or be planned to consist of different health professionals, legal staff, faith-based contacts, so we expect that imams uh, will be recruited school staff or others and may include a person who understands public safety perspectives. In other words, a police officer or a member of the uh, Joint Terrorism Task Force or Department of Homeland Security, this sort of thing. Um, so again, this is a model that is very similar to what happens in the United Kingdom and continues to happen with the Channel Program where um, thousands of individuals have been referred for so-called interventions. Okay, we're particularly concerned that um, the models of interventions that are being proposed are also seemingly following in the footsteps of the UK's program. Our US Attorney's Office for Massachusetts convened a meeting and hosted that meeting at Suffolk Law School in November of 2015. And uh, the meeting consisted of two representatives from George Washington University Program on Extremism um, speaking about uh, UK and uh, European models of so-called interventions, and an individual from the Institute for Strategic Dialogue also promoting, promoting the UK methods of interventions. In other words, the PREVENT program, or specifically the CHANNEL program. So individuals who are referred to these teams under CHANNEL or similar programs are subjected then to interventions which consist of ongoing conversations, efforts to change their political and religious views. Um, so it is, in effect, a, a political engineering um, or ideological engineering program 
and uh, ostensibly is voluntary, but one can imagine what sort of repercussions might befall somebody who opts not to participate, right? They could certainly be labeled, well, an extremist as a result of their unwillingness, um, put on some sort of list for law enforcement, although participation in the program as well is almost certain to keep people on some sort of list. So it's In the United States, I think we are still in the implementation phase such that we do not know anybody who has actually been referred to a formal intervention under CBE. Um, in the UK, there have been thousands of people, and we do not know those individuals personally. Cage certainly knows a lot of them. Um, I, do, I have heard that there are sort of uh, earlier um, examples or models for this in the United States. A couple of those at least have existed on a smaller scale. Um, but in terms of those that are being deployed formally under the CBE campaign, we haven't seen that yet in Massachusetts. We do know that the FBI has already, already recruited some folks in New Jersey for its shared responsibility committees. Um, I don't know yet whether any imams or other folks in Massachusetts have received letters from the FBI inviting them to join such committees, but it's certainly only a matter of time before they do. In terms of development of the um, CBE program, in the fall of that same year, 2014, the Department of Justice recruited individuals to participate in a couple of working groups, they called them. Um, one on threat assessment and one, I, I believe, was something uh, along the lines of civic engagement uh, and leadership. And for the most part, they consisted of individuals from Muslim communities, uh, with the exception of um, someone from the ADL, the Anti-Defamation League, um, in, the, in the community, the civic engagement team, right? And then on the threat assessment side, they had uh, folks mainly from law enforcement or terrorism study researchers. And um, at the end of two meetings each, they had one combined meeting, so for a total of five meetings. And then they produced, prior to the White House Summit on Countering Violent Extremism, a framework, a framework on uh, prevention and intervention strategies incorporate, incorporating violent extremism into violence prevention efforts. This is an interesting document uh, because it's internally contradictory, right? At, at the outset, um, the document notes, uh, to its credit, researchers across the globe have made it clear that the path to violent extremism is not linear and there are no valid or reliable indicators to predict who is more likely to engage in extremism. At the same time, then it, li it lays out seven so-called problem areas, the first of which says some young people may be at greater risk of feeling isolated and alienated, making them more vulnerable to recruitment by violent extremists. So we have this this uh, ostensible acceptance that there are no valid indicators of who's more likely to engage in violent extremism, setting aside how subjective a term that is, violent extremism, right? We're not talking about violence, we're talking about extremism. And then saying isolation or alienation may make one vulnerable to quote unquote violent extremism. So, and the, um, the document is very sprawling. It, it covers um, so many different uh, positive initiatives that communities may already be participating in, such as, you know, offering ESOL classes to immigrant communities and attempts to um, fit them within this umbrella of countering violent extremism and suggest that any services offered to immigrant communities or marginalized communities uh, are a way of preventing violent extremism. That's actually a very disempowering and offensive contention um, for our Muslim communities. There's no evidence to suggest that providing services is going to prevent um, political violence, but what it does allow is this sort of community building approach that allows folks to um, apply for funding to do things that they already were doing that are very positive initiatives, whether it's countering domestic violence or um, addressing bullying of Muslim students in schools, to get funding for them without necessarily buying into the idea that this is a counterterrorism operation. Um, unfortunately, in the UK, this is very much how the PREVENT program began as well. Our understanding is that agencies initially received funds for community building projects, and over time they began to learn that uh, this was a surveillance program, that actually they were expected to provide information on those that they were serving. Um, and once other, uh, the communities that they were serving got word of the fact that this was happening, that it was a surveillance program, any agency that was receiving prevent funding was really highly stigmatized um, and folks stopped participating. In, in our work at the Muslim Justice League, we represent people who are approached by the FBI for questioning or other members of the Joint Terrorism Task Force for questioning. 
And many people engage in those interviews without realizing, A, that they are under no legal obligation to do so, they have a right not to, and B, really not understanding the risks they're putting themselves in by doing so without an attorney present. Um, one of the most primary risks is coercion to act as an informant. And some of the ways that the FBI can do that to folks is by um, getting them to, them to talk long enough that they make uh, inadvertently a, what's called a false statement, which is a federal crime. Um, they can then threaten that person with prosecution if they don't act as an informant. There may be other ways to threaten someone with prosecution, or they may be able to um, threaten problems in immigration for either that themselves or a family member if they are not all U.S. citizens. Um, they may be able to simply threaten the release of embarrassing information that the individual doesn't want the whole community to know about. Um, and so there's many ways that people may feel they have no option but to act as a informant, and that's one of the reasons it's so important people, when they're approached by the FBI, just say the magic words, I don't wish to speak with, an, with you without my attorney, I'll have my attorney call you, like a broken record, <laughs> and then call the Muslim Justice League if they're messages. Um, but, you know, there's also positive incentives. There's certainly funding incentives, and I don't want to um, ignore the possibility that many folks may believe that they're doing a service to their country. Some folks um, really believe that they can help root out so-called extremism, um, they can get the bad guys, uh, particularly people may have certain views about U.S. foreign policy um, and think that what we're doing is actually a, a good thing. Um, that certain regimes should be supported, right? So we are a heterogeneous community, but the CBE program is like nothing else, really highlighting those differences and fragmenting us. And um, beyond just putting our informants in mosques, now it is putting informants in our healthcare settings and in our schools and even in our own households, so that it really feels like there is no safe place to express dissent and to organize. What we do, in the United States is either going to help protect or does, you know, really dangerously harm um, our brothers and sisters in countries where there are even fewer constitutional and human rights protections. Because Washington is leading a campaign of CDE not just in the United States but internationally. You can see the State Department traveling to different countries, promoting this idea of countering violent extremism. And yet when we look at countries with, uh, you know, very troubling human rights records. We see the way that the, the term extremism is uh, very clearly warped and used against democracy activists, the press. Um, take for example in Saudi where they executed many folks at the beginning of this year, 2016. Among those they executed were a small number of nonviolent democracy activists, including Sheikh Nimr al Nimr. Uh, the leader of a uh, minority religious group there and a, and a nonviolent democracy activist. And, um, you know, in, in expressing support for um, the Saudis' uh, execution, the Bahraini regime uh, noted, you know, that they supported them taking all, me all measures necessary against, I think they used the term actually, extremism or something similar. So we see how, um, you know, this subjective terminology, like terrorism, but even perhaps a step further, terrorism does suggest some act taken. Extremism is even one step further in that it, it really seems to suggest ideology. Um, that can be used um, with really disastrous consequences for human rights and freedoms worldwide.